Uh, Tim, thank you very much for the very nice introduction. Can you hear me in the back? I'm going to try to speak into the microphone uh, for the recording. Um, actually, I was in Wisconsin recently, and uh, I wondered why nobody wanted to go out to dinner with me, but uh, maybe that's why. <laughs> um, okay, I I'm going to start this off uh, with a very sort of personal recollection, and this will get me into the topic of communicative language teaching. And as Tim said, from there, I'll, I'll move eventually to the end. We'll be talking about uh, consumerism and various other things associated uh, with current approaches to, to language teaching materials. <clears throat> if I go back to 1981, uh, I was living in Barcelona. And at that time, I'd been teaching English for a couple of years. And I was one of these people who started teaching English because I was a native speaker of English. And I also had a, a, a BA degree. And that's all you really needed at that time. Um, I, I suddenly realized, not suddenly, I, I gradually came to realize that I was really a terrible teacher. And I was only teaching very intuitively. Um, and so I, I became uh, fed up with this because I wanted to stay in Barcelona. And I also wanted, I, I didn't know if I wanted to stay in teaching, uh, but I knew I wanted to stay in Barcelona. So um, I went to the uh, British Council. Uh, there was a, I knew they did teacher training courses. And I did at that time a Royal Society of Arts uh, certificate. Uh, I think, I don't know if it's called Diploma Certificate now, but it's a one-year course. And uh, that really uh, changed things for me. It, it not only informed me about teaching, it made me interested in teaching. And um, I became so interested in teaching uh, that I became very fanatical about one part of the course, which was about methodology. And at that time, uh, communicative language teaching um, was really taking hold as, as a kind of dominant uh, set of, again, to call it a method, this whole thing about approach or method, but it was certainly a set of principles about language teaching that was becoming uh, sort of official, if you like. And in fact, if, when we did the exam, the practical exam for the RSA course, if you didn't do a communicative class, you, you would fail, right? Um, but I embraced this. I didn't have a problem with that. And, and to the point, actually, I, if I look back, I was actually forcing communicative language uh, teaching on my students. So I didn't really take into account uh, their particular educational backgrounds, issues around educational culture, uh, their preferences. Uh, I just said, this is great for you, somewhat evangelical in, you know, in tone, saying, you know, this is the way to do things. We're not going to do those boring things you've been doing so far, uh, grammar translation or audiolingualism or various other uh, previous methods, if you like. Um, but as I thought about it, um, in, you know, subsequent to that, um, I really was part of a, again, this sort of, not, not the exact beginnings, but certainly in the middle of this process of spreading communicative language teaching around the world, to the extent we could say, uh, you know, it's, it's an example of a globalized uh, way of teaching. And I would say that to more recent incarnations to task-based language teaching, which I see as growing out of the same principles, but far more technical and uh, far more well-defined, I think, than, than uh, previously CLT was. Uh, so what I'm going to do today is first go back over the rise of CLT and TBLT. I'll add on TBLT, but I'll put them together in a way. Um, and a lot of this information many of you will know, so just bear with me. I'll then try to frame all of this in terms of globalization theory. Very briefly, I'll look at globalization theory. We don't really have time to go into too much detail. I'll look at one particular way to look at globalization. And I'll argue that CLT and TBLT fall into this as a globalized phenomenon, if you like. I'll then move on to the global uh, TEIL textbooks. So I'm just putting teaching English as an international language. And I'll use, I'll use international language. I won't use lingua franca, and I won't use foreign language. I'll just use this this particular term, international, and then move to uh, conclusion. If you like. So if we go back to the uh, 1970s, you had the Council of Europe, uh, which, is which actually is a cultural organization set up in 1949 uh, for academics uh, from, and educators also from different European countries to meet and talk about different ways of doing things. And in particular, what's interesting to us today is they talked about uh, different ways of teaching languages, different ways of conceptualizing languages, and different ways of teaching them. And so in the 1970s, uh, there, were, there was a whole series of publications, and these were foundational to communicative language teaching. And some of the things that were behind this, I'd like to go through. Um, one of these was that CLT was about new ways of viewing language education 
in uh, modern societies. Right? And uh, I've just taken this as a somewhat exemplary quote. This isn't from the 1970s, it's from 1991, from the Gutkin Thomas' book on experiential language uh, teaching. By the way, if you have, do you have the, you have the bibliography? That I, I sent a bibliography, so any, any authors I mention will be in that, okay? Um, and so I just took this quote as an example. It's actually about humanistic approaches to language teaching. And um, what it says is, in the aftermath of anti-establishment movements with explicit anti-institutional implications, educa educational approaches which called for the de-schooling of society, or in its less radical forms, for a basic humanizing of technocratic and dehumanizing schools, had gained ground. To humanize schools would require an orientation towards holistic education, which aimed to promote growth in interpersonal awareness and interpersonal sharing, as well as intellectual development. There's a lot in that. Uh, but basically, this is about different ways of thinking about education. And again, a lot of the people who were meeting in the, in the, in the early and mid-70s to talk about these matters, again, were part of the post-war generation, and they also were looking at it, they, were, they, were, they lived through the 60s and the early 70s, and were looking at changes going on in uh, the industrialized societies of the world at that time. And so there was this kind of backlash against what was seen as dehumanizing schools. Yeah? And this actually is a very interesting foundational part of CLT, which I think has been lost in recent years. People don't think about these things, but there was a humanistic side to it that, that's very, very important. It led, for example, to ideas about learner-centeredness, which have become very popular. There was also changes, there were also changes in ways that uh, languages uh, were being conceived. Um, and first we could look at Del Himes' work on communicative competence. Uh, I will say Himes' work on communicative competence is connected to a, a broader uh, reframing of sociolinguistics. And there's a lot more to it uh, than, than has actually been presented in a lot of language teaching literature. So I think uh, a lot of people in language teaching have sort of cherry-picked some elements of Himes' theories and his, his thinking. But in any case, what really has been taken up is uh, this, this whole concept of communicative competence. And again, this is a shift away from an exclusive focus on grammar, and we understand grammar in terms of syntax, morphology, and phonology, and also a focus uh, on lexis, so basically the nuts and bolts of the language. Uh, not saying that those aren't necessary, but moving away from just a focus on that, uh, to the way that we use language in different contexts. And of course, notions like appropriacy uh, came through this. Uh, there was also Michael Halliday's work, uh, Early Forms of Functional Linguistics, which of course he went on to develop in great detail to the point that functional linguistics and Hallidayan theory um, have become very big in many parts of the world. Um, and so, again, Halliday's early work, he looked at his own son and how his son uh, so in a sense, growing up with the necessity to, to create meaning, uh, to establish contact with other people, to perhaps impose some sort of control on other people. Um, and so what he put first was the idea of making meaning, and then what follows the making of meaning is the actual development of a grammatical system, for example. Right? And again, this idea uh, was, was seen as very interesting uh, by the people who were thinking about uh, new ways of teaching languages. And finally, there was the work from philosophy of John Austin and later John Searle, and the development of what was known as speech act theory, which again was sort of in the realm of pragmatics, or a particular form of pragmatics. And again, uh, what's interesting about speech act theory is it became foundational to actually the writing of syllabuses, you know, where you have the functional syllabus. And so you started seeing a change in materials where you went from just having a list of grammatical structures to say, asking for and giving information, or making suggestions, or recommending, right? So you had a whole list. And again, this is traceable back to the work on speech act theory uh, by Austin and Searle. There was also changes, uh, there were also changes taking place in, in uh, teaching practices. And I remember a long time ago, probably about the time when I did the course uh, in Barcelona in the early 80s, uh, one, one person I know somewhat cynically said, once you understand the principle of the information gap, uh, you can teach, you know, that's all you need really is the information gap. Um, so this is somewhat a reductionist approach to CLT, but again, what he was talking about is the importance and the way the information gap was right at the center of so many things that were going on. And again, the information gap is, is, is put in simple terms, is one person has information the other person doesn't have and you create a necessity uh, for communication, that they need to communicate with each other to exchange the information. And ideally, they would use, in an English language teaching classroom, they would use English to do that. Okay? So it's a way of pushing information. 
uh, sorry, pushing communication. It's a very simplistic uh, idea about communication. It's very partial because it really just looks at the transactional part. It doesn't look at the sort of affective side of communication and various other aspects. But there it is. It was, you know, it became foundational. And um, added to that, again, this information gap, get people speaking. The second one, it's necessarily inherently good to speak and to do so as frequently as possible. Now, in my day-to-day -day life, I know a lot of people who talk too much, and I wish they wouldn't talk so much, but in the lang language teaching classroom, for every single person, this is a principle. You want them speaking as much as possible. Uh, maybe not listening, just speaking, right? And of course, this is tied to a very, again, I'm simplifying here, the notion that one learns to speak by speaking. And this is tied with experiential approaches to education that could be taken back to Dewey a century ago. Um, you know, if you want to learn to do anything, you need to be doing it hands-on as opposed to being told about it, if you like. So again, those are the, um, again, three major principles, I think, to CLT and some background uh, to what I'm talking about. Um, I'd like to move now to the idea of globalization then, because as I said at the beginning, I would talk about CLT a little bit and then move to the idea of uh, globalization. Um, I could, again, cite a lot of different theorists uh, of globalization. I'll look at this one, because, this particular model, because it's one that's been used quite a lot. Um, it's become very popular, and I think it's because of the, well, it's simple, and it makes a lot of sense on the surface. And what you have is, this is uh, Upper Durai's uh, theory of scapes. Uh, scapes are forces and flows of globalization. And what Apadurai talks about are five general types of scapes. So this, in the world we live in, these things are going, you know, these are these flows and forces that are going on around us all the time. And one type of flow is ethnoscapes or flows of people. So maybe the, the idea that I've come here from London, but certainly in a bigger sense, not just individualized, we see movements of people as we've never seen them in the world. Sometimes going w across, you know, one nation state border, sometimes going across an ocean. Uh, technoscapes or flows of technology, that could refer to the hardware of technology, but also certainly software. Right? Uh, finance scapes or flows of money, again, commodity speculations, uh, uh, national stock exchanges, and this is the kind of global flow, force and flow that's got us into trouble in recent times. Again, footloose capitalism, this type of thing. Um, number four, media scapes or flows of information which could include newspapers, magazines, uh, or more developed recent um, forms of information, satellite television channels, websites. And finally, idioscapes, or flows of ideas. And some examples would be uh, human rights, environmentalism, uh, free trade movements. And what I'd like to do is make a point that CLT is, in a sense, an idioscape. Right? It's a set of ideas about language teaching and the ideas about language teaching are tied, again, to particular ways of seeing language and communication, particular ways of seeing how teaching should be organized or how a syllabus should be written. Right? So I put here, it's a global flow of ideas about language teaching and learning. But one thing about idioscapes is that they are not innocent. I mean, it's not just these ideas are floating around and they're just there and you just take them up. We need to look at them in terms of being ideologically loaded in the sense that they're related to sets of beliefs and feelings about the best way, in this case, the best way to conceptualize language communication and language teaching. And ideologies themselves are always and necessarily constructed in the interest of particular, a particular group or groups of people. So in this case, perhaps the academic and educational community is propagating CLT itself. So people are going around the world talking about these things. Okay. So again, we need to move away from the idea that you know, that, that CLT is just ideas. We need, they're linked to, to very specific ideologies. So if we, where we have ideologies, we will almost inevitably have a clash of ideologies, right? And uh, I'd like to cite just a couple of examples. One is the work of Suresh Kanagaraja. And in this quote, uh, he makes an analogy uh, between the sort of business world, if you like, and, and the world of language teaching. So he says, just as the technolo technologically and economically developed nations of the West, or center, hold an unfair monopoly over less developed, or perhaps a periphery, sorry, periphery communities in industrial products, similar relations characterize the marketing of language teaching methods. Okay? And he's looking in particular at a context that he, he's focused on in his research, for example, in Sri Lanka. Right? So you have this power differential 
that's quite uh, pronounced. There's also a sense that new approaches to language teaching are disembedded. They're lifted out of their culture, their, their source context, and then taken up elsewhere in the world. And there is seldom any dialogue between exporters of new approaches and their importers. Uh, I, I've got some problems with the PowerPoint because I was shifting things around, and I, I didn't actually, uh, you know, you have the, what do you call it? It's a, it's a cascade, but, you know, this effect when you have one thing come and another thing come. So it's off a little bit. And you'll see later there'll be some things that come on before they should. So I'm sorry about that. Um, but any, in, in any case, this idea of this disembedded, uh, disembeddedness of CLT, it comes from somewhere in its origins from the Council of Europe work in the 70s, and then now is spread around the world. And again, what I would argue here also is there's seldom any dialogue between exporters of new approaches and their importers, which relates to what Kanagaraja would say, uh, and also not any discussion of the form and content of the approaches or their ideological underpinnings. So again, there's no critical problematizing of it. There it goes again. Uh, it's all up there. Uh, reconciling the global and the local, though, has become uh, something quite important to many researchers. And Kanagaraja himself, uh, along with people like Adrian Holliday, uh, Alistair Pennycook, and many others, have explored uh, how there can be some reconciliation. Getting away from ideas where simply the global just flows over the local and overwhelms it, right? So you, uh, to get away from a very simplistic model like that. So there's always a local and global interacting and looking at more dialogic uh, uh, approaches to, to the process. Um, and what I, what I put up here is a, a term that's been used quite a lot in the social sciences uh, in the last three decades when people look at globalization, glocalization. And glocalization uh, actually is taken from the world of business in Japan. So when the Japanese began to export, um, people in companies started thinking, well, we have to take into account the local. And again, this, this term glocalization. Uh, came about. <clears throat> Much later, in the social sciences, people you know, took this term and embraced it and thought it described very well, again, this dialogic process. It's not the only time that the social sciences have done that, by the way. A very popular term nowadays is communi uh, communities of practice, which actually began in the business world in California. So very often, a lot of terms that are used uh, have their origins in business, which is not particularly what a lot of people using them, myself included, would like to think. Uh, but in any case, uh, globalization does come of a business context, and what it actually conveys in the second bit there um, is the idea that the global does not merely overwhelm or swallow the local, rather syntheses emerge from contacts between the global and the local via, uh, that should be not of processes, processes uh, involving the interpenetrating of the particular and the universal, where the particular again is more the local and the universal is more uh, the global. So, this is where, this is the funny one, yes, okay. So, how did I do that? I don't know. Um, so, localization processes in ELT uh, involve a call for local teachers to work out their own solutions, appropriating what they deem suitable from globally circulating ideas about language education in the development of locally generated pedagogical practices. Um, and language teaching materials uh, are at the center of these solutions. So, um, one second, sorry, okay. So the, uh, what I would like to do now is, is move, to the, um, move to the idea of the global textbook and commodified identities, and I'll be attempting to explain uh, what these actually mean. Uh, the global textbook um, is a term that uh, my, my ex-student and now a good friend in, in London is using uh, to refer to textbooks that are used around the world um, and that are, are marketed out of one location or two locations, but the intention is they be sold around the world. And a good example is the Headway series, which many of you might be familiar with. So Headway is written by British authors, um, and there's also an American version, which explicitly says American Headway. And the idea is that this, the basic idea of the book, the way it is fundamentally, can be exported uh, around the world. Uh, John Gray has a book coming out. Some of the things I'll be saying at this point uh, are actually ideas I've developed with him, and I, and I, I want to make sure that I cite him. There's a book uh, in the bibliography, uh, which should be coming out next year, uh, which is about his PhD research and, and further thinking about uh, these ideas. <clears throat> so here we have the, the global textbook. Um, 
I, I wouldn't want to suggest that people writing these global textbooks are somehow um, thinking that, well, they can do the same thing everywhere in the world. It's actually quite the contrary. And there's a great deal of time spent uh, in, uh, among publishers thinking about um, how they can reconcile differences around the world and still have fundamentally the, the same materials. And the whole idea of culture uh, is very much uh, at the center of these concerns. And where culture comes in is also a concern of where you might have particular topics that you can't deal with. You can deal with topics in one part of the world but not in another part of the world. And one example that John Gray cites is the whole issue around um, gays and lesbians, right? So you have some books that have been developed where you have a gay character or a lesbian character in the book, right? Just incidentally. Uh, or in the same book, you might actually have a focus on issues around gays and lesbians, right? So you actually take that as a focal point for discussion. And so what happens is, in some parts of the world, that section will be taken out of the book, right? Because it would be deemed to be inappropriate, or, again, local authorities will say, we don't want that kind of thing. And so this has led to uh, a very curious, um, very curious phenomenon and a very curious acronym. Um, when John was looking at this, about ten, started looking about 10 years ago, he came across, well, he says here, some publishers provide lists of proscribed topics uh, while others rely informally on the acronym parsnip. You know, a parsnip is a, a vegetable. I, you know, I look at a parsnip and I don't think about these things, but anyway. Politics, uh, alcohol, religion, sex, narcotics, isms, isms being communism, environmentalism, socialism, and pork, right? So these are the taboo uh, subjects as a rule of thumb. One publisher's list I saw contains some 30 items to be avoided or handled only with extreme care. This included alcohol, anarchy, AIDS, Israel, and six-pointed stars, politics, religion, racism, sex, science when it involves altering nature, such as genetic engineering, terrorism, and violence. Now, what that means to me, in a way, is sort of taking out of the books uh, a lot of things that make life worth living, and uh, also the kinds of things that many people actually do talk about uh, quite a lot on a day-to-day, -day, even moment-to-moment -moment basis. Um, so what Gray talks about is, by contrast, what might be allowed into books. And he says, it seems to be allowed to have sanitized presentations of various aspects of national cultures, their geography, social norms, history, iconography, and so on. In effect, the traditional content of foreign language textbooks. And it's quite interesting, that, because if you look at books today, they're very different in what they actually focus on culture-wise. And I'll come to what that culture might be. But certainly in the past, you had very much an association with nation states. So if you were studying English 40 years ago, for example, you might have an American textbook that really only had things about the US, or a British textbook only with things about Britain. And certainly when we moved to the realm of other languages, French, for example, you would expect to have a map of France and also various uh, references to what is supposed to be uh, French culture. So this is kind of a move in that direction again, but in a more splintered way, because no book can sell around the world by simply saying they're only American or only British. It becomes more difficult. So what I'd say is that what, what, what's actually come about is there's a a move away from the national cultures, if you like, to what I'll call a global culture. And uh, this global culture is related uh, to ideas around what I mentioned earlier, commodified identities. What is commodified identity or what is the commodification of identity uh, becomes an interesting point. Uh, Monica Heller and her work, uh, Monica Heller spent about 30 years looking at the whole issue of French in Quebec, as well as other issues, but in particular that issue. And she's charted uh, a kind of evolution uh, of the way the French language has moved from being framed as something of the people, um, something very, with a lot of uh, high affective content, if you like, and again, Quebec and nationalism, uh, to more recently, um, again, being, being set up as more skill, if you like. And so, again, what I've said here, and I'll read the PowerPoint, uh, the commodification of language means a shift from a value of a language for its basic communicative function 
and more emotive associations such as national identity, cultural identity, the authentic spirit of a people, and so on, to valuing it for what it means uh, in the globalized, deregulated, hyper-competitive, post-industrial uh, new work order in which we now live. Again, so again, Heller is situating this again in the global sphere of the way, uh, the way global economics are working. Um, and again, seeing how we've had this shift. Now, commodification, again, most of you will know, is traceable back to Marxist theory, where you have this contrast uh, at a very simple level between uh, use value and exchange value. So what, what's really happening here is it's much more like uh, there's a shift from language as use value, and the use value is communicating, but also there are emotive uh, uses of language uh, to simply exchange value. And again, the whole idea of exchange value, commodification of the language like English, is the way you've seen it set up as a skill, um, or the way you've seen it set up as a qualification, for example. So if you apply for a job, very often English is something you need. So again, it's seen as something that can be bought and sold. It has exchange value on the job market, for example. But uh, Lash and Lurie, in uh, recent work, have noted that commodities, uh, as they say, have no relationships, and they only have value in the way that they resemble every other commodity. And so, English as the consumer good, called global English, is understood to be vaguely the same thing in different educational contexts around the world. It is the language for communication in business and leisure settings that everyone needs to know in the age of globalization. Now, you might say, well, am I saying English is the same everywhere in the world? I'm not. I'm just saying that the way it's set up, the way it's being sort of packaged and presented to people, it is. It is much more the same everywhere than it was before. And again, that's because it's become somewhat denationalized. Again, books don't tend to say this is only British English, if you like. They all have different voices. And um, giving this talk in another context, somebody asked about the work on English as a lingua franca, and again, bringing in different accents. And again, a lot of books coming out are bringing in accents that are away from the, the traditional look at, say, British, American, or Australian English, if you like. So you could have people from India, if you like, in the books. Uh, but none of this is, is particularly, um, it's, not a, it's not a challenge to the idea of the consumerism that's actually behind the books. It's just simply saying there are a lot, it recognizes there are lots of Englishes, right? <clears throat> and again, the actual English that's the same is, is really the grammar is basically the same and the, the basic lexis is. Um, so what you need then is to bring English alive, uh, and this, this is where we bring in the whole notion of, of, of branding, if you like, and that's what Lash and Lurie uh, look at in their publications. So there arises a need to bring English alive to make it more attractive and ultimately more, more saleable or sellable. Is saleable a word? What was I thinking? Anyway, uh, in order to inject commodities with life, uh, advertisers brand them, and branding means this, that they link them to particular worldviews, behaviors, and artifacts, uh, developing in the process narratives which over time become recognizable to the public as ways of life and lifestyle options that can be opted into or abandoned depending on circumstances. Now, again, in a sense what you're doing is you're, you're presenting something that people can aspire to. They can aspire to being that person. Um, Examples of branding of individuals now are, are actually quite easy to find. I mean, one good example is David Beckham. So David Beckham, you, is everybody, who is David Beckham? You know David Beckham? Raise your hand, yes? How is that? <laughs> He's not even very good, but anyway. Uh, so David Beckham is known for being you know, a sports hero and everything, uh, great footballer and all that, but he um, is probably more known for his whole image and um, it's actually quite interesting. A colleague of mine had these, uh, these two advertisements that had run in magazines in Japan. And one, of the, one, of, one was an ad for men, I can't remember the product, and the other one was an ad for women. And in the ad for men, David Beckham, his, he, had a little, he had more beard growth and his skin was darker. A and he had this really stern look on his face and he was sweating. And in the one for women, his skin was lighter, he was sha he'd shaved and, and he had a kind of angelic look on his, on his face. And the reason why I'm mentioning that is David Beckham seems to transform from photo to photo and from situation to situation. 
and to the point where people associate him with, with a lot of different things and kind of a lifestyle option. So if he has his hair in a certain way, you might find a lot of kids who want to have their, their hair that way. Um, and again, we could go on and on with, with examples. What's interesting about Beckham also is the uh, language is the smallest part of, of his appeal. How many people have heard him speak? Yeah. 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 He has a very unimpressive voice. Uh, it's kind of a, a, kind of a squeaky voice. And, uh, and so I th it's interesting if you get into uh, the realm of multimodality, what he actually communicates is far more about other forms of communication besides language, the body language, the, the dress, and everything else. So he's actually quite interesting, uh, not only him, but other people, other celebrities, if you like, uh, because of the way they are, they come to be celebrities and what they communicate, and also the way that they represent branding, branding of lifestyles and ways of being. So... Um, Right, I'm getting lost here with David Beckham. <laughs> um, what I was going to say is that there's also wrapped up in this, uh, and in the, the global textbook, um, this kind of lifestyle option, as I'm saying, that's, that's being created, and I'll, I'll, kind of, I'll give you more details about it in a moment. But the lifestyle option is around, again, a kind of view of the world, particular behaviors, and even artifacts. And uh, I think fundamental in all of this is, is a certain cosmopolitanism. And cosmopolitanism, again, is another term we could talk about for a long time. And I'd just like to look at three forms of cosmopolitanism. Um, one is what we might call a very cosmopolitan, co cosmopolitanism light, uh, which really is around the, the world of tourism, right? When you're a tourist and you go somewhere. And uh, Ulf Hanners is a, is a Swedish uh, anthropologist. And this book in 1996, I recommend to everyone because each chapter he goes to a different city and he just seems to wander around and make observations, and very good observations. And one of them, he, he talks about the concept of home plus. And uh, what he says is the individual uh, wants the place that he is visiting or she is visiting to have one or two exotic attractions, but for the most part wants everything else, the standard of accommodation, the transportation facilities, the nature and quality of services, and in some cases even the food, to be the same as it would be at home. So all of us, anybody who's traveled, knows that all airports look the same, um, and that you can also find the same sort of uh, clothing chains just about anywhere you go in the world nowadays. So again, home plus is that comfort zone. So it's very, it's very much a cosmopolitanism. Yes, you travel. Yes, you've seen other things, but only a little, not too much. Another, the other extreme, perhaps, is, is people working more in, in intercultural, uh, intercultural education and other, uh, say, looking at citizenship, for example, in many countries in the world. And I've quoted David Held here. David Held is well known for his uh, publications on globalization. In this case, he's talking about what he calls uh, cultural cosmopolitanism, which he says uh, should be understood as the capacity to mediate between national cultures, communities of faith, and alternative styles of life. It encompasses the possibility of dialogue with traditions and discourses of others with the aim of expanding horizons of one's own framework of meaning and prejudice. Yeah. And again, this is very much part of an intercultural agenda for, for education and is very high-minded and again is a sort of deeper form of cosmopolitanism. There's, there it goes again, sorry. Uh, but there's also another cosmopolitanism which you might find somewhere in between. So we might see it as an engagement with the other, which goes deeper than the superficiality of Hannah's home plus, but does not attain the moral high ground implied in Held's cultural cosmopolitanism. And this cosmopolitanism is, is driven by a desire to consume the other, uh, cuisine, sightseeing, music, cinema, and so on. It's a domain, um, should be, it is the domain of uh, those members of society with sufficient economic and cultural capital to afford uh, to do so. And so there's this idea of a kind of global consumer citizenship, which Garcia Canclini has talked about in his work. And again, as I said, it's a very middle class uh, agenda, if you like, and uh, it's about being sort of a modern person in a modern world. Okay. Uh, another thing it's about is being successful, in a sense. And um, what I found when I look at, um, if I look at sort of typical language teaching materials today, um, is that success is very much at, at the center of what is actually going on, what's being presented. Uh, first of all, there's success which is associated with celebrity. Um, if you look at books nowadays, they'll have uh, photographs. There are always lots of photographs, but photographs in particular 
of uh, historical figures who were kind of have a celebrity status, uh, such as Gandhi, um, more recently Nelson Mandela. Uh, you'll also have people like David Beckham, whom I mentioned earlier, uh, J.K. Rowling as an author, uh, or Bill Gates. A lot of stuff on Bill Gates. And um, activities I've seen in the books, you'll get things like, uh, why, why do you admire this person? You know, why do you actually admire them? That seems, it seems to make the assumption that you do admire them because they're, they're so successful. But there are also non-celebrities who are successful because you couldn't have a book that only had, well, you could, uh, but you probably wouldn't have a book that only had famous people in it. Um, so very often these activities are used to set up uh, activities that are meant to move closer to the learner. And the way of doing that is to have other individuals in the book who are not famous or you think will not be recognized. Um, but these people are interesting because they tend to be, on the young side, they tend to be very attractive people and from a range of racial and ethnic backgrounds. Um, so again, there's this kind of, these, these are the kind of people you might, you might want to be. Um, and, um, oh sorry, I didn't mean to go on. So again, there's an idea that what you're presenting is something that, that people might uh, aspire to. Um, when we move beyond success though, there's another type of uh, way to look at the job market, and I, that's what I meant to put on now. Um, there's also an aspect of career changes. So again, you don't see people who are unemployed, but you do see some people who are between jobs. Um, and this is deliberately done because more and more today, as Zygmunt Bauman uh, points out, uh, a steady, durable, and continuous, logically coherent, and tightly structured working career is no longer a widely available option. So we live in a, a time where people do not have the same job for life. In different parts of the world, this is true, le true or less true, if you like. But certainly in many parts of the world, there is a, a tendency in this direction, where people, what they're doing at 30 is not what they'll be doing at 50, probably. And so, as an example, uh, actually I won't tell you, what, well, probably in the bibliography. I've looked at one book in particular, I don't want to single it out. It's called Cutting Edge. I don't know if anybody's used this book. Maybe the author's here, I don't know. Uh, but I, I don't want to, to single it out. I just picked it randomly, and somebody told me it was being used quite a lot in London. Um, so this is, a, this is an example of the kind of things I'm talking about. Uh, Claire Davis resigned from her job as a geography teacher in uh, secondary school and started retraining as, as a, should be as a plumber. Uh, Lorna Whitworth, 29, and husband Ian gave up their jobs in the city of London and moved to the country to run a small hotel. Right? So again, you have this idea that people will be changing jobs uh, during their lifetimes. And in fact, the kind of people uh, that we're talking about here are people who have what, um, what Bauman refers to as low drag time. And low drag time is used in business to refer to people who can move very quickly. So you could tell them tomorrow you're moving from New York to London and they won't have family, friends, or anything else to, to hold them back. So again, I think this part of the book, when they talk about jobs and people working, they've also inserted this little element of uh, being able to change jobs, if you like. Again, reflecting what's going on uh, in the world we live in. There's also in the books a, a sort of conflation of the public and the private, and this has been building up for a long time. Um, if we look at the world around us, we have over the last three or four decades the rise of the reality show um, and also, they, first they were chat shows in the U.S. where you had people going on and, you know, sort of metaphorically stripping in front of the audience, so telling the audience every problem they might have. Some of the more confrontational programs, people getting into fights because somebody's having an affair and they come on. So we live in a world where this is sort of part and parcel of television in many countries. And of course, the, in, the, in the realm of politics as well, we have public figures. Uh, you couldn't have a better soap opera than Silvio Berlusconi in Italy right now. And, and so, again, he, you know, this whole issue of how much of a politician's private life uh, should be aired in public uh, comes about. Um, and uh, Frank Ferretti, uh, Ferretti I, I cite in the, in the bibliography as a British sociologist uh, who has looked at uh, this, this sort of idea that it's okay to emote in public. Right? It's okay to show your feelings and to sort of let it all out, if you like. And what you see in the books that uh, are being published uh, this is just three activities, and they could be seen as kind of a progression uh, from something that's not particularly um, invasive, if you like, in the, sort of in the personal life of the, the student, to one that maybe is a little bit more. 
And if we start off the first one, uh, it says, work in pairs. Have you got any brothers or sisters? In what ways are they similar or different? Which of your parents, grandparents, do you take after? This type of activity has been in books for a fairly long time. But it probably in the past was about as far as books went in getting personal, whereas now it's fairly light, fairly superficial in that regard. Uh, the second one, uh, social behavior. You go, out on a you go out to a restaurant for dinner. Do you dress up, uh, wear smart, casual clothes, wear traditional dress of your country, uh, wear whatever you feel like? Right? So now they move from the family into your wardrobe. And the final one, um, I showed this to a colleague who thought it was very sinister. Um, it said, uh, under the heading, how socially responsible are you? It said, would you hand in a wallet that you found in the street? Park in a disabled parking space, drop litter. So again, this is putting you in the realm of dishonest activity, if you like, and almost suggesting, or not suggesting, it's hard to say, but would it be all right? And so you're sort of entertaining something uh, that I, I think probably wouldn't have been in books before. And so my conclusion really, and this is somewhat is repeating what I said before, is that in these books, by you know, having this kind of public and private conflation, a lot of reference to the world of business, uh, to changing jobs, to careers, to being successful, and I could go on and mention quite a few other uh, you know, things I found in the books, is that uh, it's working towards the development, it's community of competence, but also the development of a certain kind of cosmopolitan capital. And so, Again, what I say is running through the uh, TEIL textbooks today, a representation of cosmopolitan capital, which I'll see as a variation on, if you look at theories of Bourdieu, on symbolic capital. And this, 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 uh, this cosmopolitan capital may be defined as the behavioral patterns, value systems, and cultural knowledge of the well-educated and well-traveled offered up as resources or assets to which the English language learner uh, can aspire. And one can easily see these global, this, uh, these global textbooks in, in, in terms of Althusser's work on interpolation. So you, you, the book is kind of calling the individual into, you know, into this world, saying, hey, you, come in to this world of beautiful people who are, are successful, in a sense, and also are very modern and doing the kinds of things that you should be doing, you know, using modern technology, shopping, this sort of thing. That's, one thing that's interesting about the book is how much shopping goes on, by the way. And, and you, have, you have a kind of sense of the English language learner as somebody who spends a lot of time in airports and shops and, and, and does, well, also talks on the telephone, but probably not, probably has a mobile phone at least and, and is using, I guess Twitter will be brought in uh, very soon. So again, there's an attempt to be modern, to be actually on the sort of cutting edge of what uh, people are meant to be doing. Um, contesting materials, it is worth pointing out that teachers and students are not idiots. Uh, they're not always heeding this interpolation of coming into this world, and they adapt and reshape published material according to local context. So that's worth uh, pointing out. Uh, what needs to be examined in such cases, though, in my, my view, is, is, the, is the consumer culture being resisted in form or in substance? And I say this because I, I came across some research, uh, somebody who'd done a PhD in the UK, and had done an entire, the whole thing was about developing uh, language teaching materials in that person's particular context. And what he had done basically was to use the books like the ones I'm talking about as a template. So where you had a famous person like Bill Gates, he would simply put in a local personality who was famous. Right? And he thought that was making the books more locally sensitive, which it was, but it wasn't getting around uh, this, this kind of consumerist and, and sort of this veneration for, for celebrity, if you like. And he had quite a few of the same activities Again, he just changed the details, really. So I think it's worth you know, looking at that. And finally, um, there, there's a study by uh, Karen McMahill here in Japan. This is probably classes she was doing about 10 years ago. The publication I've cited there is from 2001. Um, she, what she did was she met with students, all of whom were women, who were interested in feminism, and she developed what she called a, a sort of a feminist English language teaching uh, class. And so she... Um, she basically negotiated a syllabus with the uh, students. The actual methodology she used was fairly traditional. She used grammar translation, um, but what she was aiming for uh, with these women she was working with uh, was a sense of developing a sense of self in English, if you like, a as sort of international feminist. And she had, for example, one project would be to go to a, a feminist conference and you would communicate with people from around the world. 
Now, I, th I think that what, what MacMahill did is, is uh, very interesting, but I think it's probably not as common as maybe it should be because most people work in contexts where uh, they're given either a book or a syllabus or both, and they're actually you know, told pretty much what they, what they need to teach. The entire British education, uh, the, the, sy the system of education, particularly in England right now, is, uh, is founded on that principle. Uh, over a period of about 25 years, teachers have had more and more, I'm talking about the mainstream schools, by the way, have had more and more power wrested away from them uh, as far as being able to decide the content of what they're teaching. And the national curriculum for all the subjects is so loaded with content, it's about 90% of what you can actually get done in a classroom. So teachers have very little leeway. So again, this can happen in different parts of the world, and I suspect that most teachers work under these pressures, which makes it more difficult uh, to resist at any level uh, some of the things going on. But there are, there are ways to do it. Um, I found a website recently, uh, which I thought was quite interesting, because the, the principle of it is possibly a way of resisting um, the books by, by looking elsewhere for materials. So you don't look for commercial materials, you find a website with a sharing of materials. And it's a quite interesting one. This is called uh, TESOL Islamia, and it presents itself as an alternative source of language teaching materials for Muslim teachers and students around the world. I went to the site, and um, I, I couldn't really find very much on it. And what I did find seemed to be, um, to me, not particularly interesting pedagogical activities. Mainly there was translation of the Koran into English. And, um, and the discussion activities really uh, seemed very conservative to me. So there was no taking on you know, world capitalism or anything like that, quite the contrary. And so I didn't think it was particularly radical. Uh, it seemed to be very, have a very essentialist notion of religion and culture around Islam, if you like. Uh, but the basic idea of, of sharing sites is actually a, a potentially powerful one. I, I'm sure as many of you know, you might even participate in, in them already. But I think we go back to some of the ideas I mentioned very briefly by Kanagaraja, Adrian Holliday, and others in the midst of the global imperative of consumption as dominant ideology in general and in TEIL, there's a, the continued need for the critical approaches to be taken up in a multitude of TEIL contexts around the world. Okay? So again, there's a need for this. How it's done is actually quite difficult, as I said, in some contexts because there's quite a bit of control over what can be done. So just as a mode of conclusion, I would like to um, just go through a few points. On the one hand, uh, there's the idea that the ever-increasing interconnectedness of the world, uh, which is one of the most cited characteristics of globalization, means that the uptake of CLT, TBLT, the commodification of English as a necessary skill, and the positioning of learners as cosmopolitan global citizens or consumers is likely to continue and even increase in coming years. But this idea rests on two assumptions. One, that English will remain the global language. And two, that the Anglophone countries, in particular the US, will continue to exercise considerable, though by no means complete, dominance over global forces and flows, technology, the media, finance, and so on. And certainly there's a lot of talk in recent years about China, um, also about Brazil and India. And so there's all the prospect of living in a sort of multipolar world. However, U.S. cultural, economic, and political hegemony in the world uh, could be on the wane along with many of the assumptions which people around the world have made over the past 60 years. Sorry, I've just said that about yeah. um, And there could be changes in store. Three things, really. Going back to CLT, um, what languages are most studied globally, uh, how languages are taught, and the kinds of teaching materials employed. So I'm trying to link back into the CLT argument. The case about what languages are most studied uh, globally, uh, English seems to have a very strong foothold, which doesn't seem to be challenged for the moment with the rise of China politically and economically. Uh, but again, we don't know how things are going to evolve. And uh, what I found quite interesting over the last 20 years is to observe how at least in little, small contexts around the world, I, I've, I've, been able, you, I've seen Spanish used as a lingua franca. So you'd have two speakers who are not Spanish speakers using Spanish. Um, these are, again, very small compared to the, the larger uses of English, if you like, in the world, but they, they're actually quite refreshing to see on an occasion. But I might end by saying it might be there's no such changes occur, and far more likely uh, is a future falling somewhere in between these two alternatives, 
a more recognizably multipolar world than exists at present, but one in which the English language and the influence of the Anglophone nation states will continue to be important. Okay? So that's, on that note, I'll just end. Okay? I'm sorry I've been looking at this all day. Probably, I'll be filmed you know, looking down at this, but that's where I had it. Okay? Thank you very much.